morning, Kuyamora Saoborna. Welcome to the Road to Election 2021, your roadmap to the local government elections where we unpack the DA's manifesto. Today we'll focus on the DA's plan to combat crime and ensure good governance in the interests of you, the people. Approximately 58 people are murdered every day in South Africa. Over 100 cases of rape are reported daily, and those are only the reported cases. Corruption is at an all-time high. Only the DA has a plan to effectively combat crime in your community, and only the DA has a proven track record of clean governance. Post your comments and questions on our Facebook and YouTube pages, or send us your voice notes to 063-991-8375. This is your manifesto, and we want to hear your voice. Joining me to unpack our offer is DA Shadow Minister of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs, Celia Brunk, and our Head of Policy, Gwen Nguenya. Welcome. And of course, we also have JP Smith with us, who needs no introduction. Gwen, crime rates are undeniably high in South Africa, and SAPS seems to be losing the battle against crime. Why is this? You know, crime statistics are very difficult to keep track of because they also are highly dependent on the levels of reporting. So just because crime statistics go down doesn't necessarily mean the crime in that area has gone down, just reporting may have gone down. One of the more useful polls, I think, to look at is that Gallup Law and Order Index, which is really a public perception survey. So it asks people in countries all over the world, this is a representative sample, on items such as their feelings of confidence in their local police. They ask questions about their personal uh, safety, so feelings of feeling safe, so their feelings on how safe they feel, and then also on certain incidents of crime such as theft and assault. And on this poll, South Africa has actually gone down, and we're now ranked number five in terms of um, the most dangerous countries in the world. So we're the fifth most dangerous country out of 144 countries. So I think just in a statistic like that alone, one can sense or at least get the feeling that we are losing the battle against crime. And I think the reason for that lies in the really the entire ecosystem around safety and security. So uh, challenges in crime prevention, uh, law enforcement, and also in prosecutions. And Gwen, the DA's manifesto speaks about being tough on crime, but also even tougher on the causes of crime. What does this actually mean and why is it so important? Well, this was a little bit of a cheeky um, steal from, I think, a term that was popularized by Tony Blair on being tough on crime and tough on the causes of crime. It essentially just speaks to the idea that, you know, uh, the challenges with crime don't just start at law enforcement. Um, if you go one step back from that, there's also challenges with crime prevention. And I think all of us in an ideal universe would like to make sure that crime doesn't happen in the first place. But obviously, each part of that ecosystem is equally important. So law enforcement is absolutely critical so that people also don't feel like they are operating in an environment in which they can get away with crime with impunity. So um, that is very important. And so is then prosecution and showing that when people are identified as or suspected of crime, that the criminal justice system effectively sees that case through. But making sure that we deal with the underlying causes of crime is so, so important. And I think often it can be seen as taking a soft approach to crime. And that's not the case at all. Any country in the world that wants to take a hard-headed approach to crime has to be absolutely concerned with dealing with its underlying challenges as well. Silly, if I can bring you in here, the, the ANC wants to centralize police power even more, but of course the DA is very opposed to this. Uh, why are we opposing this and, and what? why is localized law enforcement so important? Yeah, so Richard, the ANC's default uh, position on many things is to try and centralize power. If something doesn't work, let's, send, let's uh, 
concentrate the power at the top. And uh, it is something that is baked into the ideology of the ANC. Um, the problem is, as the police commissioner has uh, admitted, the police are unable to fulfill their statutory and constitutional obligations to protect people and to safeguard them. And what we really need is not more centralized power, not more concentration of decision-making at the top in Pretoria, but to allow local law enforcement, whether at a provincial or a municipal level, to test certain methods, um, to experiment with certain solutions to crime problems, uh, and then to account to those local communities about how policing resources are spent. Um, and we've seen in Cape Town, I'm sure JP Smith is going to speak about the various initiatives that they are piloting there. But the point is that none of those solutions like the LEAP program and the gunshot detection program and all of these interventions that have so much promise, none of that would be possible if Cape Town did not have a metro police, if, if all of the powers and the decision making was uh, centered at the top. So what we really need is to go against this, uh, this instinct to, to take up all the power at the top. And the DA committed to fighting the suggestion, I think it's, it's in the uh, white paper on policing, the suggestion that uh, Metro Police Departments be taken up in the National Police. That's exactly the wrong direction um, to take, and the DA will fight it all the way. And so we will be addressing some of those issues with JP a little later in the show. Um, Will neighborhood watch groups, for example, um, form an important part of this type of localized uh, crime fighting operation? They will, Richard. And we've seen uh, in the past uh, the, the violence and the rioting in KwaZulu-Natal, how important uh, these neighborhood watches and local communities getting together to uphold the rule of law are, uh, especially if the police uh, are hiding away or they can't handle the situation. So, you know, government is not a prefect that lords over society and, you know, um, has an exclusive role when it comes to, to uh, upholding the rule of law. There is definitely a role for uh, local communities, neighborhood watches, CPFs. And in fact, they have the ability to augment the resources of the state because we know there aren't enough police. Um, We've got constrained resources. Um, the police simply don't have the capacity to, to be in all of the places all at once. And so it's crucial that police cooperate with communities, uh, not just to share information, resources, but also for the legitimacy of the police. Um, it, is, it is very important that communities uh, see the police as being on their side, and I think um, involving people in community uh, uh, policing forums and working with neighborhood watches is an excellent way of achieving uh, that sort of cohesion uh, between, uh, between ordinary citizens and government. So it's a partnership with shared responsibility. Thank you. If I can come back to you, Gwen, um, technology is a fantastic tool that we can use in our plans to fight crime and to tackle the crime crisis. What technologies have or will the DA be investing in to assist them in this, uh, in this battle against crime? Yeah. Well, just this originates from you know, our values and principles, which we are strongly committed to having evidence-based uh, policymaking. And it's no different in the area of policing. So this is actually information that I've learned from JP, who's here with us today, about how where we govern, we are already taking this approach in safety and security. So I know particularly in the city of uh, Cape Town that we are absolutely dedicated to um, evidence-based policing in which you know, making sure that we are approaching safety and security from an information-driven, intelligence-driven, and data-driven approach is obviously essential to that. And what drives or enables that then is obviously the effective use of technology. So um, making sure that you're using CCTV cameras, uh, making sure there's gunfire detection technology, and also making sure there's integrated and computer-enabled um, you know, call taking, uh, dispatching, and in-vehicle mobile um, enablement systems. So if I can come back to you, I mean, we've seen 
so, much, so many times that service delivery is failing in almost every single ANC municipality throughout the country due to corruption, due to, due to poor management. I read this morning there are some areas in Mukhali City where there, have been no, there has been no power for seven months. I mean, that's absolutely insane. Infrastructure has completely collapsed. How did we get to this point? I think the important point is to note that not all municipalities in the country are collapsing. Uh, it is, in large part, the ANC municipalities, the places where the dominance of the ANC hasn't been broken in the past 20 years, that you see the worst decay, the worst mismanagement, the worst deterioration of infrastructure, municipal finances and accountability and all of this. And uh, I think it is fairly clear that the ANC's way of governing is responsible for this. Um, you know, we can talk about the way that the ANC perceives itself. It doesn't see itself as an ordinary political party. They, they don't see their councillors being accountable and their, their heads being on the block uh, at, at election time. They see themselves as, as some kind of a natural representative of the people and elections are just a dress rehearsal for internal ANC processes. And that's why you get cater deployment, the policy uh, uh, that uh, uh, you know, the ANC is implementing effectively, where they deploy agents of the party, party agents, in technical positions that require non-political skills and expertise. And over many, many years, if you implement a policy like that, you don't only lose skilled uh, people, you also turn a career in local government and government in general into something bad. You know, no professional person who's not a cutthroat politician um, wants to put their career at risk, um, put their hand, you know, fate in the hands of, of local ANC bosses. And of course, there's been national legislation, uh, I mean, you know, restrictive uh, employment practices, racial quotas that are, that are enforced in, in recruitment uh, that doesn't always accord with, with the type of skills that are available in a particular province or a particular part of the country. And all of this has broken down the professionalism and, and the expertise in local government, but also there has been chronic underinvestment in the basics of local government. And this is what the DA means when we say we'll get the basics right. So spend the money on replenishing uh, water infrastructure, electricity infrastructure, uh, maintaining the roads. Don't squander that money on show projects and, uh, and, and you know, corrupt uh, um, enterprises because if you don't invest in basic service infrastructure, you get the sort of uh, problems such as uh, blackouts above and beyond ESCOM load shedding, water shedding, which is now a, a reality in, in Johannesburg, for example. So um, those are the problems, but getting the basics right is the solution. Uh, and I think the DA's uh, offer, our manifesto, our prospectus in this election is pretty clear about what we will do and only if the municipalities get the basics right can they perform a proper role such as assisting with law enforcement and so forth. And you did refer to um, cater deployment. And Gwen, I want to come back to you there. Surely this is just government serving itself and not the people. I mean, absolutely. I mean, Celia's done a great job of defining it. And essentially what we have seen is this. And I think it's important to remember that it's not by accident. It's not something that's happened organically or by mistake. There was a deliberate strategy to deploy party loyalists in order to take over, um, you know, strategic levers of the entire state apparatus in order to weaken and corrode the state from within. And that's absolutely what we're seeing. And what that does is obviously to serve the agenda of the political party as opposed to the agenda of, of the public. And then if, for example, the DA takes over some of these ANC-run municipalities, it's, I would imagine, quite a job to turn that around. Absolutely, because it requires a, a thorough culture change um, in, in expectations. Yeah. I think also in many communities across the country, um, there has been this expectation that if we support you, if we help get you elected, there is some kind of quid pro quo involved, um, perhaps in kickbacks in the form of tenders or EPWP jobs. And it's been really difficult where we govern to say that is not uh, our offers that should you elect us, we will make life better for everyone 
everyone who lives in this community. We're going to get basic services right. We are going to tackle safety and security, um, etc. All the all the uh, offer areas in our manifesto. The offer is not that should you give us or lend us your vote, you will get directly a job or a tender in return. And reversing that culture is extraordinarily difficult, but we are very much committed to doing so. And I think when we talk about turning around uh, municipalities that have been ANC run, uh, I think the experiences from DA-run municipalities in the Western Cape, for example, as well as Midval and Coca, um, give us a bit of a blueprint as to the best places to start and exactly how we need to go about that, Gwen. Absolutely. And also in other areas where we governed in Swane, for example, we made sure that, for example, with EPWP jobs, they were based on a lottery system um, and not based on your uh, party or political affiliation. And we take that through right through the entire way that local government works, where we make sure that we appoint uh, people within our governments based on their experience, their qualifications, their potential, etc., essentially based on merit and not their, their party political connections. And even in the supply and procurement system, we ensure that any suppliers who have been found guilty of wrongdoing are blacklisted from being able to, to do you know, business in the future with that local government. You talk about procurement processes. That's a massive ship to turn around as well if it has been abused. Salih, if I can come back to you, a lot of South Africans who are dealing with municipalities, ANC-run municipalities around the country, have accepted that there will be some kind of give and take um, and, and going past the actual real processes in a procurement process. How do you get away from this jobs for PELs and tenders for PELs when you take over uh, a municipality? Gwen got it exactly right when she said it starts with a culture change. Um, you know, the, the cliche is that uh, culture eats a strategy for breakfast, but as Helen Ziller is fond of saying, a culture eats everything for breakfast. Uh, so the first question is, how do you change culture? And I think uh, a change of leadership in the first instance, which happens at the ballot box, is the easiest way for ordinary people to instill a change of culture in their local municipality. The moment you have the ANC losing an election uh, and a DA mayor taking over. That's almost a signal by itself, but obviously it's not enough. It's not enough to send a signal that has to be backed up with some serious uh, consequences. So what you would want to do is fire the first shots, identify the irreg uh, irregular contracts flagged by the Auditor General of the municipality that are still in place and that are draining the municipality's coffers, see if you can review those contracts and get proper consequence management, getting folks suspended, investigated, and fired if necessary, and, and put up a fight. And that's how you, you change the culture. Um, but you can also do smaller technical things, such as making sure that, uh, for instance, you put your, your tender, your supply chain management system uh, on, a, on a on a, a, a work process where everybody can see at what stage the tender is. So if the tender has been advertised, but it's sitting uh, at a particular committee, it's sitting at uh, the evaluation committee for two months and it's not moving, then you know something is not right. And then you can go in and, and dig deeper. Uh, the same with, with looking at your uh, income collection, your revenue collection in the municipality. That's the other major area of corruption where people tend to take bribes and so forth. If there is proper processes in place, the use of technology, you can see on a workflow management system, um, who owes the city money, who is responsible for collecting it, and then it's just a matter of, of proper management and making sure that you act on the information. But it doesn't start with these technical things. And I can also tell you about opening the bid adjudication and so forth. But it really, it, it starts with a culture, with leadership, uh, and with courage, picking a few crucial battles against the corrupt, uh, winning those battles, and then convincing the rest who might be thinking of, uh, you know, putting their hands in the cookie jar. Uh, this is on a balance of probability not the right thing because you are going to get caught and the mayor has enough courage and enough political backing and enough resolve to see through the action against you. Thank you very much, Ali. As we sort of draw towards the end of our first section, Gwen, perhaps I can just ask you for a quick comment. If someone out there is uh, living in a society, a community where they're struggling with crime and they're not sure where to cross their X on November the 1st, what would your advice to them be? 
well, to vote for the only party that is not just leaving their fate up to the national, you know, policing department. Um, I think that's the clear, crisp offer that we're making is that although policing is largely falls under the um, the SAPs, we are doing everything we can where we govern locally to ensure that, um, you know, where SAPs might be decreasing the number of officers, that we are augmenting them. But that ultimately our goal is to see greater policing functions and capabilities devolved to the local government level, which is closest to the communities who experience insecurity. Final thoughts for you, Sudhu? I think it is. it starts with getting the basics right, which is in the DA manifesto. Um, spend the ratepayers' money wisely on the basics of local government because we need those ratepayers. Uh, we need the rates base. South Africa cannot afford to chase away a folks whose contributions are funding the services of government. And you do that by clean processes, by getting the basics right, by investing in service infrastructure, um, maintaining uh, those, those services. Uh, and then, uh, if, if you have the basics right, then you can go further and, uh, you know, implement uh, metro policing and, and start doing all of the things at that higher level uh, that, that Gwen speaks about. And I think it is a real possibility, especially in our metros and our larger towns. We can do it. We can get things done. But it starts with voting for the right party. Exactly. First of November, we have to go out there, we have to vote for the Democratic Alliance, vote for the DA, the party that will get things done. Thank you very much, Celia. If you're sick and tired of sleeping with one eye open because you're feeling unsafe, or if you're sick and tired of endless corruption that robs you of better service delivery, you have an opportunity on the 1st of November to choose the only party that gets things done. Go out and vote DA. Remember, you can join this conversation by posting your questions and comments on YouTube and Facebook or you can send us your voice notes to 063-991-8375.
that we've unpacked our offer on fighting crime and ensuring clean governance, we turn our focus to the DA's existing record of action in the 26 municipalities where we already govern. To unpack this further, we welcome to our broadcast Horatio Hendricks, the DA's Mayor of Coca, Dr. Ivan Mayer, DA Federal Chairperson and Western Cape Minister of Agriculture, and JP Smith, Cape Town's Mayoral Committee Member for Safety and Security. Let's jump straight in. Horatio, the DA took over COCA in 2016. In what state was the municipality and what have you been doing to turn that around? Thank you, Richard. Um, shout out to our listeners. Yeah, um, Richard, it was, it was a stark difference between uh, what we knew was happening and what we actually found was happening. Because the rot was, was obvious before election, service delivery just ground to a halt. <clears throat> But the rot we knew was 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 there, and, and what we thought was flesh deep when we took over it was actually into the bone. Um, and I want to make one example, and, and maybe you can extrapolate from that. So, so when we took over, the fleet was was four percent operational. Now, if you, if a municipality doesn't have a fleet, how are you going to perform services? How are you going to get even the basics done if you don't have a fleet? So, four percent. Uh, of your fleet operational. So if you've got 200 vehicles, that's eight vehicles on the road. Um, so when I look deeper into why only 4% of our fleet was operational, you, you, you realized how bad the governance actually was. Because these guys, first of all, they ran the, the, the fleet that they had. This is ran that into the ground. Um, nothing was repaired. If there was a breakdown, you park it in the yard and you move on until nothing was left. Then they took out a loan, a 20-year loan from the development bank. Now, already a mistake because your vehicle has got a, it's got a shelf life of five years. It's got a depreciation of five years. So if you take out a loan over 20 years, the vehicle is, should be replaced after five years. For the next 15 years, you stop paying the loan. They took that vehicle and just ran it into the ground. And then when they had nothing left, they said, wow, let's lease some vehicles. So then they leased more vehicles, but the, idiot, the, the the most ludicrous thing that they did was they took out a contract that said, when you return the leased vehicle, it must be in its original state, otherwise you can't return it. Now, if you're gonna use the vehicle, you cannot be that it's gonna be in its original state when you're done with it. So they couldn't give the vehicles back. By the time we took over, that lease was still in place. Took us about six months and we said to the company, listen, come fetch your vehicles. We don't give a damn what it looks like. You can take us to court, we'll get our own vehicles. So by the time we took over, 4% of the vehicles was on the road. That's the type of governance that we came from. Today, 95% um, of our vehicles are on the road. I get regular updates every morning as to if there's any breakdowns and, and, and what we're doing. We've got over 200 vehicles, we, but the thing is, Richard, we didn't just go out and buy vehicles. We actually went into the yard, looked at what the situation was. You would find a truck needs a battery and it's back on the road. A bucky would need a spark plug and it's back on the road. But it was so bad here that not even the private sector wanted to do business with, with Koha municipality. So you couldn't even go and buy a spark plug. So the vehicles just came to a halt. We fixed over 100 vehicles. I think about 115 vehicles that we fixed and we pushed it back onto the roads. We acquired an additional 58 vehicles to date. And, and in less than two years, we had a full fleet that is operating for the people and making sure that we deliver services. So the, the, the state of the rock, Richard, was actually very bad. There is a stark reality between wanting to govern and actually getting into governance and realizing after 15 years of ANC governance and the massive amount of deployment of people just occupying space and not actually working, that you got to deal with over, over a period of time. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, uh, uh, you can extrapolate. I can tell you yeah. many stories of corruption and just fa a failing state. Uh, but, but our free department is probably the most stark reality of taking over from a, 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 an ANC-run municipality and then trying to make a difference. We sure. actually took very little and performed miracles with that. 
very clear that you're getting a lot done there. We also, of course, heard about the Plastic Road and the other big projects that have put um, Coca on the map. Um, Gwen, it's clear that in Coca that we've turned the rot around and we've heard from, from Horatio how we've done that. But there's many more examples, aren't there, in our manifesto of where we have taken over and made things work. Absolutely. I mean, particularly in the area of good governance, I think the most important, um, you know, statistics or figures to look is if you look at, for example, the Auditor General reports, um, the latest ones show how five out of seven of the municipalities that have sustained clean audits over the last four audits um, are, are DA-run municipalities. And then also, I think the most stark report that was that came out recently was that state of local government barometer that showed there were 16 stable municipalities across the country, 12 of which are located in the Western Cape. Um, no other province has even more than one stable municipality and the Western Cape has 12. So that's a remarkable achievement and a testament to how we govern. Dr. Mayor, if I can go to you, sir. The DA-run municipalities are well known for clean audits. That's certainly the financial governance record in South Africa in DA governments is, is well known to everybody. How do we compare DA municipalities to other municipalities and how are we getting this right? Uh, thank you, Richard. Uh, firstly, I think it is very important to understand that when you take over from an ANC municipality, as we've, as we've done across South Africa, you must understand that the ANC operate, if you listen to Mayor uh, Horatio, ANC municipalities are run like a criminal syndicate. That is why a culture change is so fundamental and fundamentally important. So what we do... We get the basics right, as uh, Gwen has also indicated. The Auditor General of South Africa, as well as Statistics South Africa, as well as Ratings Africa, have rated the DA-run municipalities as the best-run municipalities in South Africa. Now, those things don't just happen. It is because we are putting certain measures and implement basic things. For example, we know that a well-run uh, government municipality, they implement policies that reflect the interests of the citizens and keep the politicians accountable as well as the administration very much accountable. The question that you ask, Richard, how are we doing this in the democratic alliance across South Africa? Well, the first thing, fundamentally important, is there must be a culture change. It must start right at the top. It must be inspired by very effective in ethical leadership. The second thing for me is very important is that you appoint the right people in position. Appoint competent and fit people that are fit for purpose. For us in a municipality, very important is your municipal manager because that is a senior accountable officer. Then your chief financial officer, your head of internal order, your external order committees, they must know what they are doing. And that's what we are doing here in the Western Cape. We also have monthly expenditure reports because it is important that you have monthly expenditure reports. Richard, you asked me, what are the lessons from the Democratic Alliance for other municipalities across South Africa? It is critical, vital. You must start by appointing people that have the right set of competencies. Also, where we govern, we send a signal that we are respecting taxpayers' money. We are very much aware that many municipalities are busy with what is called unfunded mandates because in the ANC-run municipalities, we have petty projects, a project of the ANC, not a project that is run in terms of your constitutional mandate. The mandate of local government, you will find in Chapter 7 of the Constitution. So we will start with the principle of the rule of law, start with the principle of what are the objects of local government. And the objects of local government are clearly defined in Section 152 of the Constitution. Very important, Richard, is that you must invest in infrastructure and repairs and maintenance. Why is that important? Because if you invest in infrastructure, repairs and maintenance, you send an investment signal. You send a business signal. You build investment confidence, business confidence, so that you can attract more investment to your town. So it's critical that you do spend your money on, on infrastructure. You must manage your liquidity. You must manage your cash flow. That's what we do. That's the difference of the DA. Two more things, uh, Richard. 
Many of the ANC municipalities, as Gwen and Silias indicated, it is an institution of cadre deployment. That's why all these ANC municipalities are bloated. So those COE, the cost of employees, they take up to 50, 60, 70 to 80 percent of the budget. If you look, for example, in a place like Limpopo, the provincial government of Limpopo spends 72 percent of their budget on salaries. That's why there's no money for service delivery. The places with the lowest budget for COE are DA run Western Cape Provincial Government, for example. So it is important that for us that we have money in the budget to effect service delivery. And the basic service delivery is water, sanitation, refuge collection, and so far it is important, waste management. All of these things are important. But as Gwen said, we govern with values. And when you govern with values, for us, it is important that we have DA governments that are caring, that have competence, that are accountable, that have integrity, but more important, from the manifesto you will see that also implement innovation. Lastly, uh, Richard, is you must be responsive. You must give regular feedback to the residents through your ward committees, regular engagements with your citizens, with your business community. So I think the DA difference is clear and that's what we do. But the basics, govern with values, change your uh, culture in the organization and appoint people that are fit for purpose. Thank you very much, Dr. Mayer. Earlier in the show, we did speak about uh, the SAPS and crime, and now we're speaking about how in the areas where the DA governs, we are working on issues. And someone who's very, very well-versed in crime and fighting crime, of course, is JP Smith. JP, one of the DA's flagship crime prevention projects is the LEAP program um, in the Western Cape. Just give us a quick brief, what is this program and how effective is it proving to be? So I think, Richard, a good point just to tie into the, um, the position stated by Ivan is that if your city or municipality is under bad management, you're not going to have the financial resources to implement uh, something like LEAP. You're going to be broke or under administration. And when that critical need arises, you will not have the ability to mobilize the resources to do that, especially if it's not one of your core competencies, as this is not. And then to tie into Salia's comment, you, um, you might not, uh, under the ANC, have the ability to do so. So that's why we see in other municipalities, they have not been able to create police reserve service. They have not been able to create rent -a cop options. And they certainly have not had the ability to create something like LEAP, uh, which would have been seen as competition to SEPs. Uh, so it's, LEAP has been, uh, the ability to establish LEAP has been the ability not to be, as the, as the fact that we're not run by the ANC, and that we can experiment and explore with things otherwise. But LEAP itself has been a breath of fresh air. Uh, and of course, the longer they're deployed, I think the, the more, the better those results get. The longer the officers are in the areas and getting to know the areas, the more they're building up trust relationships with residents, the more tip-offs they're getting, the better results. Over the last three to four weeks, I've watched them get to a point where we're taking about two guns off the street every three days now. 20 guns a month, that's really good. Uh, for the size of, of service we have relative to SAPs. I think we're doing excellently in that regard. And that has seen, uh, overall, we've seen about a tripling of our arrest rate. That comes out of that 55% resource investment we've made, mainly under our current mayor, and recently with the support of the provincial government, that partnership has been absolutely essential to DA administrations who have understood that we have to compensate for the steady starvation of resources that national government is subjecting SAPs to, uh, the 551 officers that we've seen lost to Cape Town uh, f through uh, under the, the watch of Minister Clearly over the last three years. And as reported uh, in uh, an op-ed by the provincial chairperson of the Community Safety Portfolio Committee, Regan Allen, uh, who points out that we've lost over 12,000 staff um, in the last period. So these losses are devastating um, and we've had to compensate and we've had to be swift-footed about it. And it's not just in the bits that you see that's visible or self-evident. Um, a big part of why policing is failing is not just the lack of, of visible resources. It's the state of the criminal justice system. And probably the lowest hanging fruit in that to fix would be the state of your detective services. The fact that you have detectives sitting with over 220 or 250 cases each, when realistically they can handle about 25, means that your detectives 
are not getting the kind of investigative outcomes that you want. So no matter how many arrests you make, this is not achieving anything. And having recognized that, we didn't just stop at deploying the LEAP staff, we have hired investigating officers, many of them formerly from SAPS, who are now going to be supporting these LEAP units, doing watching briefs over their firearm, drug, and other arrests, so that we can get better uh, uh, criminal justice outcomes and, and permanent relief from the community, not just chasing our tails, arresting the same people over and over, but meaningful outcomes to change the lives of those communities so they can normalize, investment can happen, jobs can be created, clinics can stay open, libraries can stay open, housing offices can be stay open, sporting programs can happen, and all the other good and normal things communities want for themselves. JP, you've often gone out with the teams um, to see how it's operating and to um, work, work at looking where we can fix things better. What is the response from the residents been like to these programs? I think initially cautious uh, because people were worried that LEAP was a flash in the pan. When our first investments came, when we first experimented with these concepts, all the way back to the stabilization unit, when the teachers downed tools in Mannenberg and said, we're not coming back until the shooting abates. And we said, and, and SAPS couldn't find a way to make that happen, didn't have the resources. We then drew up a lot of our law enforcement staff from all over the city and deployed them across Mannenberg. And over a period of, of a couple of months, really stabilized the shooting. Then we turned around and said, oh, well, this is possible. But of course, as soon as it became evident that it's possible, everybody wanted a piece of it. And so you start redeploying that resource all over. And that's something we've been able to avoid with LEAP. Unlike our gang and drug task team that's had to work in different places, we are able to deploy LEAP in a fixed basis um, until the end of province's term. In these hotspots, there's 100 staff extra. They're working with the neighborhood watchers, building up relationships, patrolling with the neighborhood watchers on their request, uh, getting information from them. The supervisors are sitting on WhatsApp groups with those community members. So it's gone from sort of a cautious optimism, a little bit of suspicion, to an increasingly positive relationship. When I walk there now, that relationship is far more cemented. And that also goes for the relationship with SAPS. When station commissioners tell me the operations that we're doing tonight on which you're participating, these are possible because your members are with us. If SAPS were alone, we wouldn't have the capacity to do these operations. But the backup you're giving us means that we can do this joint operation tonight. So it's also enabled SAPS to do a lot more. has been a huge benefit to SAPS. Um, and the uh, unit works closely with other specialized units. So they will work with our metal theft unit. They're starting to understand that better. They're doing liquor operations because alcohol drives much of the harm that happens in many of these communities. The abuse of alcohol and the illegal sale thereof is something that they're impacting on. And they work closely with our gang and drug task team. And just back to um, the point made by Salier earlier about what we lose when we're under ANC governance. For a long time, the ANC had a very perverse idea about specialized units. They categorically rejected the value of that when every bit of international best practice shows you it is the only way to approach certain crime forms. We persisted, we deployed the gang and drug task team all the way back to when Helen Zilla was mayor. We started with the, the housing unit, the, the, the drug busters, the gang unit, the canine unit, all the different the, um, rewards and tip for tip-offs. Uh, and so that has developed into our gang and drug task team. And eventually, national government capitulated, deployed the anti-gang unit in SAPS, which we now work with extremely closely at grassroots level, and which is starting to get, uh, jointly with Metro Police's GDTT, some very good results. LEAP works with them as well, and they are in turn training the LEAP members in those core skills of making sure we make life difficult for those high flies and we disrupt that criminal economy of gangs, of guns and drugs. Thank you very much, JP Horatio. If I can come back to you, um, a lot of people living in ANC-run municipalities might think there's no hope, but from your own experience, what would your message to those people be? Well, the DA brings hope. Uh, Richard, you know, when people go to the poll on, on the 1st of November, running up to that, uh, difficult, uh, different political parties come to you wanting you to vote for them. Now, when you go seeking for a job, your, your possible employer is not going to say, fine, you can start tomorrow. He's going to ask you, where's your CV? And what's on your CV? So if a party has been governing, you need to compare the CVs of different parties. So in Kalha municipality, we've been in government for five years. The ANC has been in government for 15 years. Let's compare CVs. Let's look at what they've done for 15 years. Look at what the DA has done in the last five years. And then you appoint the best possible people. 
because we are elected through appointment by the people through their votes. So you don't just tell a party, okay, you can start tomorrow. You look at their CV, you look at their performance in, in, in governance, and you base your decision on something very realistic. Indeed. Secondly, really. we've, we, we've done the basics right over the last five years. We now move into an area that I call Kocha's next chapter, and that's to grow our local economy. Because as, as a government, we're not only in the business of delivering services, but we're also in the business of growing and developing our communities. And you need a government that not only gets things done, because we've already proven that, but you also need a government that understands how things work. So we got to grow the cake, we got to grow our economy. You, 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 you can only drive as fast as your engine allows. Doesn't matter if you put in more petrol, or you push harder on the pedal, the car is not going to go fast. If you want to go faster, you put in a bigger engine. We got to grow the cake in Koga. We got to get the investors in, create those jobs, create those equal opportunities and start alleviating poverty. Indeed. Make sure that we leave no one behind. So welcome to the next chapter of, of Koha Municipality. We're in it to grow this one uh, as big as we can. Yes, where, where the DA governs, it governs better. I mean, that's just uh, a message we can continue to put out there. Dr. May, if I can come back to you. Um, the DA is fielding a candidate in every ward across South Africa. And because we want to bring the DA difference to all the different municipalities in South Africa, what is our to-do list, do you think, sir? wants to take over a, mun a municipality. Uh, thank you, uh, Richard. Very important. In this coming election, people are tired. They want change. So earlier this year, we launched a thing, Time for Change. And it's really for us important that voters go out on the 1st of November and start being part of that change. That change can only happen when people take up the opportunity to vote for the Democratic Alliance on the 1st of November, because many of these towns go without water, without electricity, uh, soon is running in the main road. So for the Democratic Alliance, the first thing that people need to do is to become part of the journey of change. And we, as the Democratic Alliance, we believe that if you want to see change, three things need to happen. Firstly, to build a capable state. The Democratic Alliance in South Africa is the only party that has a proven track record of building a capable state. The second building block is to get effective leadership. Our mayors go through a thorough selection process. They go through a thorough training process. We don't just grab people because they've been nominated, because they belong to a certain faction. We don't get people because somebody from the Tuli House say, take this man. We are putting our people through a thorough selection process so that we have the best candidates. And we also test them, not only on the skill set, but also whether they fit the value framework and the principles of the democratic alliance. So for us, that's the second important thing. The third thing that we believe in the democratic alliance, what JP has now discussed, with in terms of the neighborhood watches, what we call active citizenship. So the democratic alliance believe in partnership and collaboration. If you look at what JP and the city of Cape Town has done through active citizenship, partnership and collaboration, reducing crime in many of these communities. So for the Democratic Alliance, it starts with building a different culture because when you take over an ANC run municipality, you are taking over a criminal syndicate. PEE is nothing but a criminal syndicate. And so you have to stop Black economic empowerment, because it is a tool to enrich a few criminally connected people to politicians. So that needs to be scrapped in every single municipality. So for us, that is important. But nothing beats appointing people who are fit for purpose, stick to your constitutional mandate, invest in infrastructure, do repairs and maintenance, and do what both uh, Gwen and Salia has mentioned four basic things, water provision, electricity, sanitation, and refuge collection. All of us on this panel, we need those things every single morning. When you wake up, you want to switch on your electricity, you want to have water, you want to have sanitation and refuge collection. 
So for the Democratic Alliance, it starts with a culture change, starts with a leadership change, and stick to the basic and execute your constitutional mandate. Because the DA get things done. So the voters have a choice. If you want to see change happening in your town, it doesn't help now to come and listen to stories of the president and say, please forgive us, we, we made a mistake in the last 27 years. As Gwen has said, it's not a mistake, it is a deliberate strategy of black economic empowerment, it's a deliberate strategy of cadre deployment, putting people in positions who cannot do the job. If you want to see change, we have seen massive change in the last five years in Koha municipality. And so if you want to be part of that change, you have a choice. That choice is to exercise your democratic right, your constitutional right to vote for the Democratic Alliance on the 1st of November, because we have fielded excellent candidates across South Africa and voters in South Africa can hold them accountable after the election on the 1st of November this year. Thank you very much, sir. And I just want to bring it back perhaps to Gwen and to JP, who can give me comment on this. One of the things that we've been saying for quite a long time, for us to be able to give the residents a better service and to fix things is devolution of power. And perhaps, JP, if I can start with you, how important is devolution of power to being able to meet the expectations of people where we are hamstrung at the moment? Very important because uh, as we've increasingly had to step into the shoes of SAPs, that has meant that we've needed the powers to do so. Um, we have taken over or extensively involved ourselves in marine enforcement, liquor enforcement, at one stage rail enforcement, uh, the gang and drug enforcement. These are spaces that local government doesn't normally uh, operate in. And that m has meant that we've had to expand our powers. Uh, we haven't sat back and waited for national government to dole these out to us. We lobbied very hard and worked closely with the Institute for Municipal Public Safety and saw our peace officer powers very substantially expanded. We've worked in terms of our own bylaws to creatively, in terms of our constitutional mandate in 4B and 5B in those schedules, to use those mandates in terms of our traffic bylaw, our streets and public places bylaw, the unauthorized occupation bylaw that starts filling in some of the glaring gaps in the Pi Act uh, to give us the effective powers to do what we need to do. We've worked with province on their legislation, so the Liquor Provincial Liquor Act and soon the Provincial Traffic Act regulations. Uh, we've uh, obtained the Marine Resource Enforcement powers. Uh, we've obtained the Second and Goods Act, pa Act powers, uh, etc. We've worked on various levels to make sure that our staff can step into the gaps that they, they need to and are able to, to do for the public uh, what, what they need us to do in their communities. Understanding the needs of each community. There is a reason you do marine enforcement uh, because in 10 years, if you don't do it, you will have no marine resources for many communities that are dependent on those resources to carry on making a living from. There's a reason you do gang enforcement, because a small number of people hold an entire uh, hold entire communities hostage as, as gangsters. So we have uh, fought hard for those. But it would be so much easier if we could simply do what needs to be done. Um, and that is to put uh, the South African police under the control of the provincial government um, or local government. Uh, DOCS has built a strong case through the Community Safety Act for their oversight mechanisms, the watching briefs they do. That is where the policing uh, power appropriately belongs at this stage. Um, and we would be able to then bring that policing focus in line with the provincial uh, needs and priorities assessments that are done that would see us focus those policing resources on the correct priorities that the communities identify, focusing the resources where they're needed, rather than the glaring deficiencies in some of your worst and most needy police stations, where SAPs, in fact, have their least resources, where the um, interventions of national government have left the most staffed, notwithstanding legal action by the Social Justice Coalition and others to try and bring that into kilter. And of course, in the meantime, um, as we demonstrated with the march again to Lentegeer, police station recently, we're having to fight off the very insidious attempt by the national government um, and Minister Kele to take control of Metro Police and law enforcement and our traffic service through the RTMC regs. Um, and those are extremely harmful things. That will again, for instance, prevent us from rolling out the kind of specialized units that, that has helped us, like our rural safety unit, like many of our other interventions. We would not be able to have these fleet-footed adaptable, localized responses to the, the challenges our communities have. Gwen, 
a, something we have to take very seriously, the devolution of power? It's really going to help us govern better where we govern? Absolutely. I mean, I think JP's response was uh, was quite comprehensive. I think the only thing I might add is just to remember that, and it has already been raised today, that this is not something that every single municipality is going to be able to do, is devolve greater mandates in policing um, in, 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 and in transport, the other areas where we've called for, for greater devolution, simply because they're not ready, which is why good governance and getting the basics right precede some of these um, initiatives. Um, I mean, I think we've talked about um, on the show before, how close to one in five municipalities in South Africa are under administration. And by the time a municipality gets to that point, it means that it has been identified that there are enormous governance failures, that the executive is no longer able to, um, to, you know, to meet its, um, its obligations. And if that's the state of many municipalities around the country, talking about greater um, mandates or greater funding for, for increased responsibility is just simply not the kind of conversation these municipalities are first and foremost needing to be having. The very first thing is they need to stabilise. Um, but that is why we've tried to, to have this balancing approach in this manifesto where we are focused on getting the basics right because we do realise that in many municipalities around the, the country where we come into government for the first time, that is going to be the first priority, the first order of the day is to stabilize the municipality and get it back on track. But we also have to um, offer a more aspirational offer for those places where the DA has been in government, where we are succeeding um, or we, we lead the pack in terms of getting the basics right and good governance. And in those areas particularly, we can start to talk about where we say a promise of more. Um, and that is exactly what we're talking about when we talk about greater devolved powers in areas like policing and, and in transport. Richard? Jeff, if I can mention, <clears throat> Gwen touches on a very important thing. These are steps of evolution. Before your municipality can make investments in things like a reserve service, um, to the best of my knowledge, Cape Town is still the only city with a police reserve service run by the city in our law enforcement department. In fact, our rural safety unit works largely on reserves. Now, reserves are getting really good results, our auxiliary members. Uh, before you can do that and before you can invest in your neighborhood watches and build the kind of strong and powerful um, and, and able neighborhood watch fraternity, you do need to stabilize your municipality. So it is, it is a step of evolution. You're going to have to stabilize. Once your basics are working, you can start working on these additional things. Mm -hmm. And that's the privilege we've had in Cape Town. S a consistent, stable, financially well-managed governance that has allowed us to start making these more comprehensive and finer tuned investments. And I think this is uh, those additional powers that we've obtained, this, the, the, this is federal, uh, federalize, federalism in action. This is how we show the devolution of power. So in the Western Cape, there is the strong argument around uh, Cape independence. It's a, it's a political force uh, uh, in, in the Cape. It's not possible to avoid these discussions. But what the party has said is that whilst there is no legally or constitutionally enabling mechanisms to achieve that, there is something we can achieve and which we are working every day to achieve, and that is the devolution of power, giving more power to provincial and local governments so we can govern better, we can avoid the pitfalls national government is creating in policing, water, electricity, and everywhere else, and we can increasingly bring those things under our control. And for that, many of the legal mechanisms exist and I don't think there's a better example than Cape Town for showing how we've harnessed and, and, and tried to take over those mechanisms done with, uh, with the resources we, we have, absolutely what is legally possible. Thank you very much, JP, and thank you to all my guests in this segment of the show. Um, just to remind you, we have been taking your comments and questions throughout the show, and Gwen and Gwenya, the DA's Head of Policy, will answer the questions directly. So right now we literally in the center of Cape Town in a community called Bonteville. We are about 85,000 people that, that live in this area. Bonteville had a very, very high murder rate because of our lack of policing in the area. On a daily basis we were losing people to gang violence. We were infected and inflicted with gang violence. Our kids couldn't even play in peace in the park. I was actually very scared even to um, leave my home. Constantly, I will say constantly living in fear. For a, a city or a government to be effective in fighting crime, you need around one police officer for every 220 members of the public. At the moment, Cape Town 
uh, in terms of SAPS resources is sitting around one to every 560. The LEAP program by the city and the province is an attempt to compensate for those very low SAPS deployment figures in those areas where it matters most. In the 10 most affected crime hotspots, we are deploying 100 officers each with the goal of halving the murder rate, seriously improving the safety and thereby allowing investment, job creation and the normalization of community life in those areas. LEAP's brought about high levels of law enforcement visibility in the area. Where there was no visibility, we now have visibility at key times. Before we had this program, there were days when I dreaded even getting up. But afterwards, I, could, I felt safe because, you know, I could be walking down the street or crossing the road or down Pontyville Avenue, and I would see five law enforcement vehicles in that time just passing me by, which made me feel safer. What we need to do here is be visible, to patrol, to build relationships with communities, to act on tip-offs, to be responsive, to attend to hotspots. We set up street WhatsApp groups in every single street of this community. So whenever there were issues, whenever things went wrong, whenever there was a problem, we were able to immediately report these issues through. Look where we're standing today. We're standing here. We walked all the way from the center. We weren't robbed. We weren't accosted. Nothing happened to us. Here's young people out, here's old people out, we joggers past us. So LEAP is not just about 100 law enforcement officers coming to an area. LEAP is about bringing communities together. LEAP is about building relationships where relationships were broken before. None of this would have been possible if it hadn't to be for LEAP and the law enforcement officers. So we need to see more local community leaders engaging the program, understanding the program and being able to communicate with community and the officers to ensure that the programs actually become successful. Well, we've had some absolutely fascinating insights from our guests and our experts uh, today. And of course, we also want to hear what you have to say. So I think our first caller from Elsie's River in Cape Town, Western Cape. I'm a resident of Cape Town and I've lived in Cape Town for my entire life. I was born and bred here. And the reason that I'll vote for the DA in the upcoming local elections is because the DA has been keeping communities in Cape Town safe, especially on the Cape Flats where violence and especially gangsterism is rife. In comparison to this, the national government through the Department of Police or the Ministry of Police has failed to deploy enough boots on the ground in the Western Cape so that communities in Cape Town can be kept safe. In order to make up for this, the DA has deployed their own law enforcement officers to make up for the gap left by the National Police Minister, Big Pele. And this is why, in this election, I will vote for the DA, because they have kept my community and many other communities safe. Well, not really a question there, Gwen, but a uh, great comment for uh, JP and his team and the DA and their team uh, that have been doing this and keeping people safe. Absolutely. And I think what that really touches on with you when you start to talk about issues like gangsterism and substance abuse is the absolute importance for those underlying, you know, being tough on the causes of crime that we're talking about. So making sure that young people have other options besides being on the streets and perhaps being um, influenced by criminal, um, you know, other gangs or other criminal elements. So making sure that our public facilities are well maintained, that there's extracurricular activities for young people. I think there's so much to be said about what goes into ensuring that a community experiences lower gang violence and lower substance abuse. And our next caller is from Inanda in KwaZulu-Natal. So I live in Etiquini and it is within a province that is dubbed the rape capital of our country. And this problem is further compounded, particularly if you are a member of the LGBT community, because essentially you'll get to a police station and you'll be laughed at. You'll get to a police station and they won't take you seriously or your doctor will disappear or you'll be further victimized by the very police who are supposed to be there to protect you. So we have a critical, critical issue with our police system and there seems to just be no political will or any kind of political action from the powers that be to resolve this. You know, just a few weeks ago, a group of about three queer men was attacked by a group of 15 and still to this day, there's been no justice. 
And this speaks to a broader political issue, I think, in this city and in this province where the powers that be are just disinterested in, you know, making us feel safe. You can't walk down the road anymore. You can't, you know, enjoy being in public peacefully because you are consistently looking over your back because you know that if something happens to you or your property, you're just not going to receive that assistance because the police system in the city and in this province doesn't work. It is in a critical situation and we really need, you know, people in positions of power that are actively going to start resolving these issues because enough is enough. Gwen, I think uh, we can safely say to this caller that where we govern, we certainly do our best to try and ensure that every single community is treated exactly the same. And we really need to look at how we can fix the issues where the police are not taking these issues seriously. Yeah, I mean, gender-based violence and violence um, experienced by people within the LGBT community is extremely concerning. Um, and I think the breakdown there particularly happens on the uh, prosecution side and where uh, criminals or, or perpetrators are not brought to justice. And I think here the importance is to emphasize the watching briefs that we were talking about, which are particularly targeted at crimes which with uh, poor prosecution um, records or history. And Particularly making sure that there are watching briefs for, for cases where gender-based violence or violence against the LGBT community is going to be essential. And what that does is ensure that um, these watching briefs ensure that there are a group of people who are, who are experts who can follow the case throughout the criminal justice system and monitor the police and also the courts to ensure that actually um, justice is done. And finally, our last caller is from Savannah City in Midvall, Gauteng. Good day. I am Palisa Tuedezi, residing in Savannah City. We can all witness the work that has been done by the DA from the past years that they had starting to be governing. The services they deliver to the people and always putting the people first. It is also a testimony of the things going well when the government governs in the interest of the people and always putting the people first. And in this manner, it means that the DA always gets things done. Well, thank you very much for that endorsement. And yes, we want you to go out on the 1st of November. Go out and vote for the DA. The DA gets things done. And where we govern, we govern better. Thank you for joining me today, Gwen. Um, I'd like our viewers to stay tuned to our social media for details on our next broadcast next week, when we'll be unpacking the DA's plan to improve housing and healthcare and simply get the basics of governance right. We hope you've enjoyed this event. See you again next week. Good day. Tot ziens. Hamagashle. The Democratic Alliance spends your money on delivering services. Where we are in charge. Unemployment is the lowest and we do not tolerate corruption. Even the national government admits the best run municipalities are all governed by the DA. But the choice is yours. You can choose collapsing basic services or streets that are maintained and clean. You can choose to live in chaos and fear or the protection of thousands of local law enforcement officers. You can choose blackouts and the devastation of livelihoods. Or you can choose a DA government that is creating jobs and working to become load shedding free. The DA is the only party that brings all South Africans together. And the only party big enough to bring positive change to your municipality. In this election, choose the DA because the DA gets things done.